Hi, I'm Joe Alton, MD, medical preparedness writer and founder of the survival medicine website, www.doomandbloom.net, where you'll find over 600 posts, videos, and podcasts on keeping your family healthy in any disaster. Together with my lovely wife, Amy, I'm the author of the Amazon bestseller, The Survival Medicine Handbook, and the Ebola Survival Handbook. I'm also the designer of the fun new board game, Doom and Bloom Survival, a great way to get the whole family together for a great game night on or off the grid. Now, there are many infectious diseases that can become epidemics in the aftermath of a major disaster. Today, we'll talk about cholera. Cholera is an infection of the small intestine caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholera. Cholera has been the cause of many epidemics in the past, and even in modern times, millions of cases of cholera are reported every year worldwide, with over 100,000 deaths. There have been seven cholera epidemics recorded since the 1800s, and a major epidemic occurred after the earthquakes in Haiti a few years ago. Disaster scenarios that cause contamination of water supplies can easily cause an outbreak of cholera in a community. Therefore, it makes sense for the medic in the family to know how to identify and treat the disease. Untreated, cholera has a death rate approaching 50 to 60 percent. If dealt with quickly, however, mortality goes down to just 1 percent. Transmission of cholera occurs as a result of eating improperly prepared food or water contaminated with the feces of an infected individual. Cholera is not uncommonly found in seafood, like oysters that ingest plankton, a collection of tiny organisms that form the bottom of the food chain. Human stomach acid does a reasonable job of killing most bacteria that are ingested. Now, note that I say most. The cholera bacteria that survive make their way into the intestine where they penetrate the walls and begin to cause symptoms by producing toxins. Symptoms of cholera present themselves within a few hours to a few days after infection. The patient will experience the rapid onset of watery diarrhea, historically called rice water stools. In a certain percentage, this will be severe enough to cause major dehydration. That's the major cause of death. This can happen in an alarmingly rapid fashion, within hours in some cases. Even the mild cases are problematic as they increase the risk of spread of the disease. Other symptoms related to dehydration include nausea and vomiting, low blood pressure, tachycardia, a rapid heart rate greater than 100 beats a minute, severe thirst, muscle cramps, mental status issues like restlessness, irritability, confusion, mood swings, and loss of skin turgor, the elasticity that you normally have. When you hold your skin, you normally see it snap back quickly, but if you're very dehydrated, it happens to stay there, something we call tenting. In severe dehydration, the skin loses its normal elasticity, and this is a major issue. Modern water treatment facilities have eliminated cholera as a major issue in most developed countries. Even in the aftermath of a disaster, proper preparation of food and sterilization of water will prevent an outbreak. For this reason, the family medic must supervise these functions closely when off the grid, as well as enforce proper hand hygiene. An effective water filter is certainly an important medical supply in this situation. This is the Life Straw, which I think is an excellent water filter to have. Uh, we have that in our store on the website. The proper disposal of human sewage is also an important factor in preventing cholera, or any infectious disease for that matter, from running rampant in a community. Appropriate construction of latrines at least 200 feet away from sources of drinking water is very, very necessary. Swift action is needed to prevent a cholera infection from causing life-threatening dehydration. Oral rehydration salts are commercially available, or they can be homemade by adding to a liter, two liters for children, of water, six to eight teaspoons of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, half teaspoon of salt substitute, that's potassium chloride, you can find it in the supermarket, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda for sodium bicarbonate. In this way, the balance of certain chemicals in the body, called electrolytes, can be maintained. In the worst cases, intravenous fluids such as normal saline or Ringer's lactate might be needed with a source of added potassium. Fluids are often enough to stabilize the patient, but antibiotics can decrease the length and severity of the disease significantly. Doxycycline, a veterinary form bird biotic, is considered a first-line option. Other choices include tetracycline, erythromycin, and ciprofloxacin, 
fish cyclin, fish mycine, and fish phlox, respectively in veterinary form, although resistance has been reported in some cases. Reserve its use for the severe cases. Supplements containing zinc may also be helpful in both treating and preventing the disease. Although effective vaccines exist for cholera, they're limited in their commercial availability and restricted mostly to those traveling in countries at risk. They are unfortunately relatively short-lasting, giving protection for about two years at most. In normal times, citizens of developed countries have little to fear from cholera. In a survival setting, however, it can and will return to wreak havoc over those who fail to pay close attention to sanitation and hygiene. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Hey, are you ready to deal with medical issues in a disaster or epidemic? Check out our Amazon bestseller, The Survival Medicine Handbook, on Amazon.com or on our website at www.doomandbloom.net.